All right, so today I'll be going over ggplot2, chapter three, individual geomes. Um, so I'll start off with an introduction for layers. Um, so based on the grammar of graphics, ggplot2 encourages you to build plots in a structured manner, building upon your plots with various layers. The purpose of the layers are one, to display the data, two, to display a statistical summary of the data, and three, to add metadata, such as context, annotations, or references to your plot. Um, the section on layers is broken up into the following chapters. Chapter three, individual geomes. Chapter four, collective geomes. Chapter five, statistical summaries. Chapter six, maps. Chapter seven, networks. Chapter eight, annotations. And chapter nine, arranging plots. Um, I'm gonna go over briefly chapter three, individual geomes. So geomes are the most fundamental building blocks of ggplot2. Most of the geomes are associated with a named plot. Some geomes can be added onto lower level geomes to create more complex plots. And to find out more about individual geomes, you can see their documentation um, within like our studio or online. So the first one I have here is a scatter plot and it's made with geom point. Um, this one, it shows um, the displacement, I think it's the gas displacement on the X axis, and I think it was highway miles on the Y axis. And then we have a line plot that's uh, made using geom line. And again, we have the date on the X axis and unemployment divided by, oh, I see those green tracks. Um, divided by population on the y-axis. Okay, and then for histogram, we have geom histogram. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I believe this one is um, just with highway and then it has the, yeah, highway is the x-axis and then it has the count for the highway, the y-axis. Um, you have a bar chart, which is made using geom bar. Um, on the Y, see on the X axis, you have manufacturer, and again on the count, the count is on the side. Um, let's see, I'm so nervous. <laughs> okay, um, and then to make a pie chart, you use a bar plot, and then you add on the coordinate, um, polar coordinates onto it. And just a note that this, the, Pie chart data here is except exerted from this website. Uh, I forgot exactly what the website is, but it's based on this bar plot. Um, yeah, question. Yes. Yeah, can you go up a little bit? Yeah, something mm -hmm. like this. Yeah, yes, yeah, okay. So mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> why uh, doing the bar plot? Um, is there any reason why they change from using geom, they say plot, geom, for bar plot? They just say bar plot. There isn't any kind of geom that which is somehow uh, um, similar in all other cases. Does anybody have some history for that or anything? Yeah, I think it's the top slide. Can you go up? up mm -hmm. oh. This one? Oh. Yeah, um, this one, bar plot. This one, mm -hmm. is it bar plot? Okay. Yeah, something like this. So we don't have that geom, which is like, I don't know, is there any reason that they didn't have that kind of thing that they have to do? Uh, you're asking about um, where it says bar plot here. Uh, the bar plot is based on um, this R script. And then, yeah, as far as the data for it, I should put the data on a slide as well. Is that kind of your, your question? Yeah, okay, I get it. I get what you mean. I get it. I get it. I think it's a good question, though. Uh, it, it almost seems like if you wanted to do a bar plot, then ggplot2 has a native bar plot geome, right? Geome underscore bar. Or if there was, if you wanted to do a line, there's a native ggplot line geome, geome underscore line. But maybe there's not a native pie chart in ggplot. I don't know. Is yeah. there such yes, indeed, there's no pie chart. Like nobody wants to do a pie chart or a donut chart. So that's why we have to 
do this trick. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah. And then, so then there were questions about the difference between like geome path and geome polygon and geome line. So geome path connects points in the order of appearance. So it looks like this point three, two would have been first, then it went to one, four, then to five, six. And then geom polygon draws polygons, which are filled paths. So basically this polygon kind of fills in, um, fills in the shape from the previous one, the geom path. And then you have geom line, which connects the points from left to right. And then you have a question. Yeah, can I ask a question? So what's a use case for a geome path? Geome path. When, when you would have... you, yeah, when would you ever use that? It works really nice when you're plotting circles with different points. If you don't do it, it kind of just goes up and down from left to right. But if you do geome path, it just kind of circles around. Cool. It's also used sometimes if you are trying to show how two variables change with time, for example, and you can um, draw draw as a path and use color for the year, so then you can see how they change together. Um, it would also be useful if you're um, trying to show the path of something, like an animal or an airplane. And so when you use your own path, it's necessary to pay attention to the order of the of the data so it, it needs to be arranged generally like arrange it first to make sure you're getting the right order yeah like in time order for example if if that's what the path is following hey team this is ryan i had a quick comment about the uh the, the geom path would it be would it be good for mapping and I, I Gustavo I'm, I'm thinking of you on this one uh, when we when we talk about geospatial polygons or, or just GIS data coordinate systems being able to link that together I, I've seen many many maps where you've got almost like a, a geom path but overlaid on a mapping circuit like like you know your run path or your your bike path your uh, uh, walking path would that coordinate system or does that correlate to the to the mapping service, the, the mapping engine in the background? Hey, Ryan, that's a good question. Because the first thing that came to my mind when we, we came to this slide, Geon Path, uh, it was related to like a alpha hole or a con convex hole, because that's something that I am doing right now. And usually I would say that you could try to put this on a map, like when you have like a very good set of points, like very random points, and you want to draw the line, like the, the, the limits of this distribution. So you would use like a, a kind of path, usually a convex hole or a hole, to draw the, the lines, to draw the border. So geom path seems to me that it's kind of related to that. So I don't, I don't think like that's impossible to do with a map, but that wouldn't be the, the best like tool for the job. If, if you get what I mean, but I, I believe it's totally possible to use. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. And I, I didn't want to add any confusion. I know that we have a, a total chapter dedicated to mapping. So there, uh, team, there's a whole mathematics that goes into your coordinate system. And that's why when Ryan, you asked the question about uh, like, you know, what would be the use case of it? The first thing that comes to me would be, you know, some kind of a biking path or walking path or you know like a sample rate of, of, of gps hits and then plotting it but maybe i'm probably confusing because there's a there's an engine in the background or a, or a gis mapping in the background that would also correlate to this uh as gustavo was mentioning if you go to the um help page for geom path online about halfway down there's an example of using it to show how two variables change over time um, for mapping, my experience with mapping is that data is usually like in a, in a simple features form or something. It's a, it's not usually just a 
in my in my applications anyway, it's not just a data frame. It's already in a spatial form that has a gotcha. GMSF, which um, will draw that kind of stuff in ggplot. So you could use geompath, but I think it's probably more common to have a more specialized data, data type. Excellent point, Ken. A lot of this stuff is over my head, <laughs> but I'm um, excited to go back and watch the video and look up everything you guys are talking about. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so this is Dion Path. And thank you all for like that in depth um, discussion of this. Uh, yeah, again, Geom Polygon. And so I, I've, I've got another question about Geom Polygons. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I promise I'll try not to have a question on every single slide. But uh, so uh, actually, if you'll go up one more slide above this. So this is this is two lines, right? But there's not a third line connecting um connecting those two open ends is it true to say then that on the polygon there's also not a line that's connecting those last two and and it's just it's just filling in between there's not actually data in that connects those last that, two dots yeah. right yeah because um i don't have the original script for where it says p but yeah these are based on the same um yeah same data like the same data yeah, yeah. okay and then, yeah, GM line connects the points from left to right. So again, it's all from the same. These three plots are all from the same data. Okay. Then we have um, questions about low-level GM. The first one being um, GM smooth. And I have that GM smooth fits a smoother to data, displaying the smooth and its standard error allowing you to see a dominant pattern within a scatter plot with a lot of noise and the low level geom um, for geom smooth being geom point. Yeah, this is, yeah, so the scatter plot um, would have been displaying the displacement on the x axis and highway on the y axis. And then you add the smoother, um, which is the line and then the shaded area is kind of like the error of the line, I guess, trying to fit the data. I think it's asking what geoms are used to draw the blue line and the gray area, oh. Oh. Not, not what's used to draw the dots. Oh, OK. <laughs> does anyone else, um, will anyone else know what would be the answer to that? Because I am not sure that in that case. I would guess geom line for the blue, and then I forget. There's, there's another because one. Geom ribbon. Ribbon, that's the one. So yeah, so then my other ones are gonna be wrong. <laughs> but it's something for me to look up. Um, so then what low level GMs are used to draw geom box plot? Um, so I have that the box plot are used to summarize the distribution of a set of points using summary statistics and the low level geom for box plot is geom point. So I guess I guess I didn't quite understand that. Could someone explain to me what a low level geom would be then? Is it just I think it's saying that some of the more complex geoms are drawn using some, using the simpler geoms that they're yeah. they're made by um sort of not consolidating but um combining low other geoms, like the smooth is a combination of a line and a ribbon. Yeah, and like I think the number one thing I took away from the low level geoms is that they each take like an X and Y um, map data to the X and Y um, axes and they all take like color size aesthetics, whereas um, some of these like higher order geoms that summarize information don't always take um, X and Y coordinates. So I think like for, box plot like geom rect would be one of the low level geoms that's used and then probably geom line to draw some of the other summary points on there and then geom point as well for the outliers at least i got one right <laughs> geom point is still <laughs> okay thank you 
And then the last question was about um, the low level geoms to draw geom violin. Not everything was geom point, but so violin plots show a compact representation of the density of the distribution, highlighting the areas where most of the points are found. Um, I guess that one's wrong as far as the low level geom being the geom violin. But here's what a violin plot looks like. Does anyone know what the low level geom for this one would be? Maybe, probably maybe geom polygon. Oh. Yeah. Geom I was density. maybe geom smooth, but I don't know how the density, I guess we could look up geom density and see how, see what low level geoms that uses. Okay. This is all homework for me to look up stuff. Ooh learning so much. <laughs> yeah, I'm like completely new to R. I pretty much started learning a month ago in class. <laughs> but yeah, okay. So yeah, well, thanks, that is... thanks for jumping in and taking this on. That's pretty Thank brave. <laughs> I was like, okay, it's a really short chapter. It should be easy. <laughs> More complicated than I thought, but... <laughs> I'm happy I had this experience and thank you all for helping me. <laughs> and I think, uh, I think Priyanka had written in the chat that um, Ryan was gonna start doing chapter four today as well. Yeah, so I, I Priyanka, unless you wanted to say something, I can jump in to, to what I was gonna cover. I'll stop sharing now. Okay. Um, so it's, it's it, first of all, uh, I, Lydia, from my point of view, I think you're to be commended for jumping in on this, something so new to you to be able to take the time. Um, I've always thought that presenting is the, is the best way to learn it. So, um, I, from my point of view, I think you did a great job and thank you. I, I learned something. I, uh, for whatever reason, glossed over the idea of low level geomes. And so had never made the connection that something that's complex, like a box plot is actually made up of lower level, uh, geomes. So anyway, um, so thank you. So anyway, uh, what I, what I was, the way that this developed is that, you know, I had looked over chapter three and I saw that it was a, uh, a little bit of a shorter chapter. And so I started to explore just to look into chapter four myself and it went over my head. Um, but what I ended up doing was um, doing a little bit of research in um, just online to find out some more about collective geomes. And then I came across a, a blog that I thought was really helpful and thought I would ta start talking about the blog as an introduction to whoever might handle chapter four next week and then figured like i'll just handle chapter four so um so anyway i, I guess as, as a way of introduction to next week um, i'll show you this blog um and we'll look we can look at the the chapter itself too so that's a lot of background information that you now have um all right you should be seeing the ggplot2 um Page, right. So, so uh, chapter three is this this idea of individual geomes that Lydia covered, and then the next one is collective geomes, and uh, and what 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 needed to click in my mind was the idea that individual geomes maybe largely plot one single row from a data set, like it says one observation from a data set. An individual geome draws a distinct graphical object for each observation or row. Um, but on the other hand, a collective geome displays multiple observations with one geometric object. And so for in my mind, that's, I, I settled on these ideas of like <clears throat> operations like sum. Sure, you can take the sum of one number, but generally sum is one number that comes from a whole bunch of numbers. And average or mean is one number that comes from a whole bunch of numbers. And so... Um, the individual geomes being that those one numbers and then the collective geomes being more along the line of the sum or the or the uh, the, the mean where you where you distill everything down into one overall number. Um, anyway, this is a conclusion I came to after trying to read through this chapter and then also coming across this blog post. So I'll put the link to this blog post in the slack. Um, it comes from uh, from this this blogger here, um, but what it, it what it seemed to do, at least for me, was to do, was to clarify this idea of of individuals and collective ones. So, so he talks about 
um, about using this, the same data set, MT cars. And you can see each of these dots represents one observation from MT cars. And it's broken out by number of cylinders here. But then the bar represents the average horsepower for that entire group. So it should be pretty straightforward to, to understand. Um, same with, with the iris data set, length and width. And then um, it's broken out. These in, each dot represents an individual operation, uh, individual observation from the data set. And then the larger dots represent the, uh, the average lengths and widths. And then where it starts to tie in closer to this chapter is this idea of, of changes in life expectancy over time. And so you can see under this data set, there's a time aspect, 2001 to 2005, and then life expectancy. And being able to, uh, to, to, uh, to convert each individual op observation into something general, where each of these lines is an individual observation from the data, but the larger lines represent the, uh, the average life expectancy changes over time. And then there was this, this paragraph here that says, we often visualize group means only, sometimes with the likes of standard error bars. Alternatively, we plot only the individual observations using histograms or scatter plots. Separately, these two methods have unique problems. For example, we can't easily see sample sizes or variability with group means, and we can't easily see underlying patterns or trends in individual observations. But when individual observations and group means are combined into a single plot, we can produce some powerful visualizations. So this blog post and then also the, the chapter start to talk about this idea of collective genomes and then combining individual genomes with collective genomes to see to, to gain new insights. So um, let's see what else comes here. So when he talks about the approach to this is starting out with a, an individual observation data set, which he calls ID, and then a, a group or a collective data set, which he calls GD and is based off of ID grouped and summarized. And then um, moving on as he starts to plot these out, once again, you see, as we were talking about the individual observations in, uh, in for this data set, and then layering on top this group data set, or this, this uh, group number. And once you put them together and clean them up a little bit, uh, you end up with, with this final thing, which combines those two concepts of individual and group. Or, or collective genomes. So, so that was a um, that was a, a, just a blog post I came across that I thought really simply addressed these these kinds of questions and made it a little bit straighter in my mind. I don't know if that'll be helpful for anybody, um, but I can put that link in the chat as well. And it just talks about how he goes about making all these different um, these different plots throughout. That was really all that I that I was going to cover on this call uh, if we had the time, and then we can go into the rest of it next week, which, which does a little bit more of the same about, about uh, capturing a proper grouping and what it does to the different plots that way. So that's all I had. Does anybody have any questions or comments on that? It's just a quick question on that blog post actually. Uh, did he use one AES layer for two different data sets? Um, not necessarily. Sometimes, um, I think the answer to that question is no, actually. So let me go back to here. Um, I think so if you use a single, like, aesthetics layer, it, like, both of those geomes inherited. So if you have, like, a summarized, I don't think you can have the summarized data along with the individual data, unless you added, like, a separate column for the summarized number, which you just would be like duplicated in the original data, if that makes sense. It makes sense in my mind, like as I'm saying it, but to somebody that maybe that like, yeah, I didn't explain it that. It looks well. like he made a summary data set and then added that like the yeah. code. Well, that you just had that should, um, yeah. And then if you go down back where you were, that code there in the middle, it, it's got 
ggplot and the ID is the yeah. one data set and then the GM bar uses GD as the second data set. So I guess as long as the names are the same, AM and HP, it kind of works with one layer. Or yeah, either it's, um, yeah, if they have the same variables, then you can do it just like that. Otherwise you have to specify the aesthetics separately for the second data set. Okay. Uh, and that might be this line here. The main point is that our base layer, ggplot, AES, AM, and HP specifies the variables AM and HP that are going to be plotted by including ID. It also means that any geom layers that follow without specifying data will use the individual observation data. Thus, geom point plots the individual points. Geom bar, however, specifies data GD. Um, Meaning it'll try to use information. Anyway, I don't know if that answers, if that's it specifically, but anyway. That's what I had, and then um, we'll do the, the chapter in depth more next week. So, give it back to you, Priyanka. Did we lose her? Okay. No, so she needs a second. Okay. I'll ask this question then while we're waiting for her. Let me share my screen again. Um, really on in, in chapter four, you see this visualization here where um, it, this is just using the data set and then it says geom point and geom line. And you see something similar here on, on the blog post. Um, let me find it. Down, down here where, where there's this, it kind of talks about the sawtooth, the sawtooth appearance um, so it's here and then you can also see it kind of here where it connects and my 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 question is are we is it safe to assume that here say in in year 2001 there's what maybe 10 let's say 10 observations and each of these 10 observations is connected to the other by a line but then one of the observations is connected to year 2002 with a line but then the 10 or so observations in 2002 are all found on this line. And then one of them is connected by a line over to 2003. Is that, is that right? Uh, did I explain it okay? I think so. Okay. Yeah. And is that what's happening is that everything is falling into the proper category except for one that, that makes the jump over to the to the next category. No, it's just that they're not they're not grouped at all. So it's, right. I, I wouldn't say that the one sawtooth line is correct. I think that because that might be going from you know Andorra in two thousand one to the United States in two thousand two. Yeah. For example. Yeah. And, and that's what he says is that this is this is not right because it is missing the grouping. Yeah, I was trying to picture what's actually happening under the data, and if it if it is in fact just kind of arbitrarily connecting one dot or one observation from two thousand one to another observation in two thousand two, is that what happens if you don't group it? I think so. I mean, it's GM line, so it's in order by the x-axis, but since they have a lot of repeated values on the x-axis, I I don't know how it decides which points to connect going from year to year. It, yeah. My guess is it's connecting the last point in 2001 to the first point in 2002, but that, I don't know, that's just a guess. Yeah. And it, so it just would depend on the ordering of the rows within the years. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's not, it's not meaningful. It's, it's a great, a good example of what happens when you don't specify the grouping 
And when you see that, okay, I'm missing something here. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's part of what these first couple of sections of chapter four talk about is the grouping as well, so. All right. What I had, Priyanka, are you, are you back? So I was saying, unless anybody else has any question or we want to have further discussion on the individual geoms, um, I guess that should be a wrap for the day. But we can pause and see if anybody wants to raise a question. <laughs> Going once, going twice. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's okay. So uh, I guess I want to thank Lydia for being bold enough to, you know, so quickly uh, take initiative and uh, discussing this chapter with us. And thank you, Ryan, for um, you know proactively uh, taking next chapter and also you know looking at these resources. Um, I think it's a good uh, segue, as in good. Um, resource for us to get started uh, while we're reading chapter four. So I think it'll be great uh, value add for all of us. Um, and I guess that's that's kind of all. Um, I guess just just want to pause and see if, if there is any anything else uh, we as a group want to do additionally, um, you know, along with while we're re reading the chapters. So I guess uh, we can always share the extra resources like you know, Ryan already did. So when we are preparing for the chapter discussion, you know, maybe if you Google something, you research something extra or, or something relevant, of course we can share that, but anything else, if you want to add on anything that might be helpful for one or more people, um, we can talk about that. Anybody has any suggestions? Prank, it's Ryan. Uh, I wanted to ask a question really quick to the team. So I do have a active data set. I wouldn't consider it proprietary. I, I, I can't see how it would be, uh, but it is uh, geome related, or excuse me, it's GPS related. Um, mm -hmm. The use case we're trying to solve or, or what I'm posing anyway, is we, we have two GPS uh, receivers and the error between what gets selected has to do with some mathematics and some other nuance. Anyway, uh, when you're troubleshooting this, when a GPS goes off kilter and just starts to consume gibberish, uh, we want to set up an algorithm that focuses on that. I wanted to use possibly shiny apps, possibly ggplot, um, maybe even some uh, more advanced uh, statistical modeling. Um, but it could be a, a, a real world use case for the team. Again, I, I can't see how it's proprietary. It's railroad information, uh, but it's, it's just recorded data. And I could probably even remove anything that could be possibly related to sensitivity. Um, if you know anything about railroading, it's pretty easy to figure out who owns what track and what locomotive it would have been that was recording, but uh, you may not have the road number. So uh, that could be a way of, of kind of sanitizing or removing anything that could be potentially sensitive. What are your thoughts? Hey Ryan, that's a very interesting idea. I would love to take a look at the data set. Right. And yes. Like if if you could explain it better, like maybe offline. I can. Even in through Slack, I don't know. So yes. what you're trying actually trying to do and what you are your ideas, what you think it would work, that would be lovely. Correct. I would like okay. to, to take right. a look. Yeah, I I I'm 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 posing it as a real world example with a guided input of, I'm kind of scratching my head here. Um, there's uh, multiple things that I'm thinking about of direction, but um, I wanted to see what other uh, opinions uh, might be able to offer as well. And it would be of substance that we could uh, all kind of work around as well, if that's an option. I've, I've got interest in, in geospatial mapping as well. So if anything that we can keep public uh, for everybody to share, I would appreciate watching. Agreed. Yep. Yeah. Sure. It does have to do with the mapping chapter, so um, uh, maybe maybe it would be advisable to wait until 
the mapping chapter uh, before we, we really start getting crazy. Um, Lydia, I, I smile uh, with your comment and, and very much appreciate your uh, uh, presenting today uh, or taking that on. Uh, that's awesome. Ryan, it, it sounds like you just signed up for the mapping chapter. <laughs> well, I may. Well, I, I, I have some I have some funny, funny use case things that I was doing with uh, uh, Leaflet and uh, uh, yeah, GPS data. Uh, it has to go all the way back like five years ago, uh, graduate level, and and then it's kind of been shelved. I've never really opened it back up because I really don't know the right direction to go with it. Um, it's not writer's block. It's kind of like I'm scratching my head like, what should I do here? What would be the most advisable thing? And I don't have anybody to reflect with. I don't have anybody to uh, uh, kind of, I don't know, brainstorm with of, of what to do with it. So. Well, if you want to discuss it, I'm up for the job, man. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. Well, Gustavo, the, the, the one thing that I had you in mind, you said you are in Brazil, correct? Uh, yes. From your introduction. So uh, the MRS Railroad, uh, MRS is, is one of the largest organizations or, or at least rail organizations in Brazil. And yeah. our, our, our company uh, ended up deploying this, this rail application in Brazil. Uh, it was 2000, I would say 2012 to 2014. Uh, we do have entities that are in Brazil. Uh, I would be very, very naive to even try to pronounce the names of the cities that they're in. But uh, at any rate, uh, we do have some, some entities down there as well co-workers so. oh that's good is this something that can live on github or do you just have a massive data set that's sitting on your laptop uh it, it could go either way so the the data that i'm collecting the the comment i'm making about sanitizing there is uh the the, the two things that come to mind is obviously when you take a time date stamp and then apply it to a coordinate system. So then anybody would know that, hey, there's where this locomotive has passed by kind of thing. That would be potentially sensitive from a security standpoint. Um, and then the second would be um, some of the media or the way in actually uh, that we're encoding it. Uh, that could be also something that I have to uh, toy with keeping in mind that the application was generated on a Linux box. So it's the structure of the sentence that would potentially become proprietary that I'd have to be careful about. But no, I, I don't have a problem uploading anything to, to GitHub or GitLab, especially uh, in this particular uh, learning environment for others to really use from a, from a real world standpoint. It's one thing to, to, read a chapter in a book and do the exercises, but if you start to process real world data, it may be more meaning, meaningful for the team. Now, maybe you can sanitize at first just to, to remove the, the most, the bulk of it. And then we could take a look and you see, if you see anything else, then we can remove it. And if you want any help, if you work for the job to, to take chapter yes. six, and if you want any help, feel free to contact me. I will, I will more than willingly uh, 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 take on chapter six. Uh, I've got plenty of other geo, excuse me, GPS oriented funness that I, I was dealing with. Um, team, one of, the, one of the use cases I, I had offered was I wanted to take railroad employment. So this is Bureau of Labor Statistics data, um, NIAX code type data, and then deploy it in a, in a uh, uh, state level, I wanted to showcase exactly almost heat map oriented or, 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 you know, plotted oriented, where in the state is the highest concentration of rail employees. Well, the end goal of this would be, that's kind of where I would target my training content towards, right? Uh, or who is my key person that, you know, manages that shop? Let's get connected with them and say, hey, I know based on stats, you've got X number of thousand of employees. Here's what offerings we could bring you, blah, blah, blah. So there is a, there is a business case to it. Um, it yeah. was never fully, fully ironed out, though. There's still some wrinkles in it. So <laughs> one of which is the amount of server, uh, server room for it. Um, when you start dealing in leaflet or... Uh, uh, open rail network, open, open street maps, uh, the size of the data sets are exponentially large. Uh, and so when you yeah. plot that uh, or try to consume it and run it on your computer, it just kind of grinds to a halt. You need some more resources. 
Ryan, I think your your uh, use case uh, would be a good example of why um, you need almost kind of a different mathematical operation or, or, or resources, computer resources to, to render what it is you're after. So optimize it. I'm sorry for side railing everyone. Uh, forgive me for, for taking that am amount of time. I'll, uh, I'll be more than happy to volunteer for chapter six for sure. Very interesting. Yeah, no, thanks, Ryan. Uh, I think this is a, this is a great way to uh, learn. That's what I always, uh, in fact, wanted to do for the group. You know, to actually do some hands-on as well. So yeah, I guess uh, I, I'm sure there are many more people who are not who are nodding and not saying at this point. So I think it will be a great idea for you to bring that new data for us. And yeah, so I think I'm counting you for the for the math chapter. And looks like. Kent might be able to help a lot uh, on that, uh, maybe on during the discussion or off that because he had mentioned that that's his favorite chapter. Yeah, if I'm if I'm around, I'm going to be on vacation until October twelfth. Okay. So depending on whether you dip a week or not. Kent, if I if I upload it to uh, uh, GitHub, I'll definitely add you or or link you with uh, the site uh, for us to download. So. Good. I'm definitely excited to take a look at that data, especially being a student right now. I am just kind of doing examples in the textbook. So it'd be cool to see like real world data, you know. Agreed. Perfect. So I guess um, that's that's that for today, and we can finally call it a day and see you all next week. Thank you, Ryan M, Ryan S, and Lydia for the discussion today. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. bye.